welcome everyone uh, here at the uh, fifth or sixth EC Beijing online seminar, uh, which is part of our online seminar series called On Things to Come. We have today uh, Professor Olivier Vitasse of the European Space Agency, who, who will talk about the Jewish mission. And you can see him in the, in the webcam. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And you can see also the executive director of EC Beijing, Professor Wing Wen Ip, in the other webcam, which is unfortunately shaking. Um, I am Laura Baldis, and I am the PR and editorial manager of EC Beijing. And before uh, we kick off and we start with the webinar, I would like to give a very brief introduction to EC Beijing. And if you have any questions, you can always submit them in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Uh, or during the seminar about the seminar. So EC Beijing was established in 2013 thanks to the cooperation between the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland, and the National Space Science Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. We uh, organize every year um, a wide variety of events uh, spanning from workshops to forums to working groups, international teams, and we cover different disciplines, different areas, all in space science. We are an institute for advanced space science studies. Um, unfortunately, given the current situation, the pandemic, we were not able to organize any event this year. But uh, that is also why we started this webinar series, with these seminars, which focus on current space missions as well as future space missions. And we have so far organized um, five uh, beginning uh, September of last year. And we have several also upcoming uh, seminars um, in 2021. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor E. And thank you once again for being here. Yeah, thank you very much, Laura. Um, so today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Olivia Vitesse. Um, he's uh, um, reporting on the new initiative uh, to Jupiter by ESA, which uh, the name is a uh, Jules for I think for Jupiter icy moon uh, exploration. Uh, let me say a few words about Dr. Vitesse first. Um, first, he, he obtained his uh, PhD at the University of Grenoble, France in, in 2000. And subsequently, he joined the uh, ESA as, as a research fellow. And um, there, he participated in a, a large number of, I would say, a, a large number of space missions, you know, from inner planet to outer planets, including uh, Venus Express, uh, Mars Express, and SO Mars. Uh, and then he also uh, participate uh, in the, the Indian uh, mission, uh, Chandrayaan one and also the, the concept, the uh, mission concept study of the giant, uh, giant planet mission. And uh, he, just a few years ago, he had uh, participated, he had now become the the project scientist of the Jews mission, which is a huge project, you know, and a very important task. And um, and he told me that he's doing a, a handling the job very well. You know, let's let's hear what he had to say. Olivia, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wing. Thank you for the invitation to give this uh, seminar. And uh, of course, it's an honor to be introduced by Wing Wingip, who is a very important scientist in our community. Uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, let me know if you see the first slide. So I suppose you see the, the slides, uh, Laura and Wing? Yes. OK, yes. good. So I will uh, I will be talking about the, the JUICE mission, so the Jupiter IC Moon Explorer mission. Uh, I am the project scientist of this uh, project, and I give the talk on behalf of all the teams who are working hard uh, to make this uh, project successful. So the, the project teams at ESA, uh, all the, the, the PI team, the principal investigators team, and the, the industry and the scientific community, which is uh, behind us. So on this first slide, you see already what the spacecraft will look like. And um, and the target of the mission, so we have Jupiter, we'll be orbiting Jupiter for a few years, and we are going to study this giant planet in details. And uh, and one of the big focus of the mission will be to study also the icy moons 
and you see on the, the first plan, you see Ganymede, and then you have Europa and Callisto in the background. So I will be talking about that during the, the next 40, 45 minutes. So Jupiter will explore the, uh, the Jupiter system, the JUICE mission, and in particular, the three icy moons. So here to give you an overview or to compare the different uh, moon system in our solar system, uh, you can see, uh, for, so for the Earth, we have our own moon. On Mars, there are two little moons. On Saturn, there are uh, a number of moons, including one large, which is Titan, very important. On Uranus, we have five medium-sized moons. On Neptune, a medium-sized Triton, which is very important, and, and around Pluto, a few uh, small moons. But when you look at Jupiter with these four Galilean moons, so Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, you see that when you want to explore um, uh, moons or moon system in, in, the, in our solar system, uh, Jupiter is really the target of interest. So and in our mission, we are going to focus on Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And the closer you are from Jupiter, uh, the most difficult it is to study for a spacecraft given the radiation environment. So that's why Io will not, we only be able to study it from remote. Europa, just a little bit with two flybys, and we'll focus on Ganymede. And Gal Callisto, we are also going to make a number of flybys. So we start with uh, uh, showing a little bit of why we go there. So the scientific interest of all these targets. So I will start with Europa. Uh, the Europa moon has the image here by Galileo is a very interesting object um, uh, because we have good reason to believe that there is an internal ocean. So liquid water underneath the crust, it, uh, it can be seen as amazing that uh, inside this moon, there are a lot of liquid water. So it's very important for the astrobiology and this liquid water is maybe in contact with the silicate rocks. So that's a, a very important target to study uh, whether life could be uh, somewhere else in the solar system. Uh, so with JUICE, we are going to, uh, to have two flybys of this moon to, uh, to study what is in the interior, but also the surface. And you see the uh, patchy orange uh, stuff here. In fact, we don't know exactly the composition. So that's very important to understand what is on this uh, surface. And we are also going to study the, the, the small atmosphere around this moon. What is interesting in, uh, with Europa is that there is a potentially uh, water plumes uh, escaping from the, from the interior of, of the moon. This is uh, still being debated. We have a few ground-based observations which tell us that there might be some plume. And that's a very interesting aspect because that means if there are some plumes, that means the moon is active. From the geological point of view, there is something going on. And also that uh, if we uh, are in the atmosphere of the moon during a flyby, for example, we can collect atmospheric material, which can tell us something about the interior of the moon. So that's, very, that's a very important aspect for, the, for Europa. Uh, Ganymede, uh, that's the main focus of the mission. We are in the, with the European community, we decided to focus on JUICE following many discussions with uh, with uh, US colleagues when uh, we were uh, defining a mission together to the Jupiter system. And in Europe, we decided to uh, focus on Ganymede. So Ganymede, uh, it's a very important uh, target. It's the biggest moon in the solar system. It's a kind of a mini planet. And you, when you look at this surface, there are craters, many different geo geological features. So from the evolution point of view, it's a very interesting moon to, uh, to study. We have also good reason to believe that there is a lot of liquid water inside the moon, also another uh, amazing fact, I think. And another amazing aspect is that um, there is an internal uh, magnetic field inside the moon. So if you think about uh, rocky uh, bodies, there are only three bodies in the solar system that uh, possess a magnetic field. So we have the Earth, of course, and we are very happy to have uh, the magnetic field to protect us from, uh, from the solar influence. There is Mercury and there is Ganymede. So Ganymede, it's a, for that, it's a very interesting moon to, uh, to study. And if you, if you look at this uh, slide, which shows what we think uh, the interior of the moon looks like. So you see first the size, so it's really a mini planet. So we, are, we have an iron core in the middle, which generates the magnetic field. Then we have a, a mantle. And then we have uh, ice, ice layer, so the crust here, uh, ice mantle, and in between, there is uh, possibly the ocean here, which is uh, squeezed between uh, two uh, layers of ice. Uh, 
So that's why it's very important to study because liquid water is a very important ingredient for life. So if there is liquid water somewhere else in the solar system besides Earth, it's very important to, uh, to study. We don't know where is this liquid water. Is it at in this location here and here? We don't know how, how deep it is. Do we have 50 kilometers of water, 100 kilometers? That's all the unknown. We just know that there is liquid water. And uh, we just are going to characterize that uh, in, uh, in details. And Callisto, that's the last uh, uh, icy moon in terms of distance to Jupiter, so after Europa and Ganymede. So because Callisto is much further away, it feels less the, the attraction of Jupiter, so it, it has less evolved over the last uh, 4 billion years. And you, we see that uh, as a record on the surface, you see the record of all the craters. So that means this moon is kind of uh, dead from the geological point of view. So why to study this moon? But that's important to compare with, uh, with Europa, which is a, an active moon, with Ganymede, which is maybe less active, but still interesting because of the ocean and the magnetic field. And then we have to compare with Callisto uh, to see if we understand the evolution of uh, moon as a function of distance of Jupiter and as a function of other parameters. But what is quite interesting is that some uh, Galileo data, uh, magnetic field data indicated that there is this uh, possibly that is illustrated here in, uh, in pink or violet, that there is a possibly also uh, uh, an ocean of liquid water inside Callisto. And that is uh, because it's still ambiguous. So with juice, we are, we are going to, uh, to check this, uh, this presence of water or not. And if there is water, it's quite interesting because why would we have uh, liquid water inside the dead moon? So this is all the questions that we would like to, uh, to understand. So here is uh, just a summary of why the moons are interesting. That's a summary plot from uh, Michel Blanc, which I like very much. So if you see, that's the Galilean moon. So if you see Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, if you want to study the ocean moons, you have to focus on those three, the one of the focus of our Juice mission. The rocky moons, there are those two, Io and Europa. Uh, the, those three moons, they are in resonance uh, with respect to their, to their orbit. So that's another interesting aspect. And in terms of active surface, we have Io and Europa. If you are interested by origin of formation, you have to study Callisto because it has not evolved since the beginning of the solar system. So that's an image of 4 billion years ago. If you are interested in how the system works, I mean, the, the injection of particles into the magnetosphere, uh, it's IO uh, because of the, the volcanic activity. If you are interested in the habitability, so possible place where life could have started or will start or uh, that we don't know, it's a Europa and possibly Ganymede, and if for life, it's a, it's a Europa. So you see that all these four moons are very diverse, very interesting, and that very interesting to see the, the, the similarities, the differences, to understand better uh, the diversity in the solar system and place where life could, uh, could start. So, and so we study those moons, but those moons, they are around Jupiter. So why around a giant planet like Jupiter, we can have some... Uh, conditions for life. So that's an interesting aspect. So we, we have to study not only the moons, but also the giant planet in the middle, and in particular, the atmosphere and the magnetosphere and all the other moons and ring dust around the, the planet as well. And that's uh, just uh, an information I've seen uh, recently that uh, I have read that the great uh, red spot is, uh, is diminishing in size. So that's an interesting. So we are going to study the atmosphere in detail and to understand what is going on there. And uh, just as a, as a joke, because we want to see the red spot, which is diminishing. It's a, it's a good reason to launch on time. Otherwise, we are not going to see it. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, we are going to, to understand the moons, how they behave in the Jupiter system. And they are embedded into the, the magnetic field, the large magnetic field of Jupiter. So that's... Uh, also something to, to study how the moon behave in the large magnetic field. Uh, that's very important. And there are some relationship between then the moons and Jupiter via the invisible uh, magnetic field lines. That's an interesting interaction to, to study from the, from the physical point of view. And the illustration of that uh, can be seen in the array of Jupiter. So we have 
I would say classical aurora because there is a, a magnetic field of, of Jupiter. So similarly to on Earth, we have the, the aurora, north and south. But in addition, because of this invisible link between the moons and Jupiter, we have also aurora due to the moon. So here, this is the aurora due to the Io moon, but we have also Europa and Ganymede and Callisto also uh, from time to time can generate a specific auroral spot. So that uh, just tell, tells you that if you study the moon, you have also to study Jupiter because the both uh, worlds are connected. And so that was the, the introduction of science, why we want to go there, why it's, why it's interesting. We have many questions uh, about oh, the moons and Jupiter. And that's why the, the, the Juice mission was uh, built around the, all these topics. And we have basically two big topics. So one is the habitability. So we study Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto, and we, we compare them. And the other one is the Jupiter system to understand everything, uh, to have the global picture. And here we, we focus on the atmosphere, the magnetosphere, and all the other satellites, IO, and also the, the ring system to see how everything is, uh, is connected. And as you can see, it's a very broad and uh, interdisciplinary science. Uh, just some... Uh, some information on the schedule before I move to uh, to how we are going to uh, to make uh, such a mission. Uh, the schedule is quite interesting because uh, yeah, when we when we work in planetary missions, we have to be very patient. So the the, the call for proposal for ESA uh, came in two thousand seven. So uh, ESA said we have a, a certain budget. Please send us all your ideas, and we will select uh, the the best mission for the for the for these conditions. After a tough competition, so five years later, the, the JUICE mission was selected. One year later, we selected the, all the instruments to put on board. Then in 2015, we have selected the industry that is uh, actually building the, the spacecraft. We aim for a launch from Kourou on an Ariane 5 in June 2022. It will take a few years, as I, I will show you, to reach Jupiter. And then we have uh, three, four years of mission, and I will explain you the, the details. And the end of the mission will be something in 2033, and it will take still a few more years to uh, to complete uh, the archive and to uh, to to close the mission from uh, from a formal point of view. So you see that uh, such a mission requires to work something like uh, 30 years. So it's really a, a long journey. And we have to be patient and we have to make sure that we give all the information uh, in a continuous way such that the people that will work in 30 years from now, they know what happened at the beginning of the mission and, and uh, they have all the information to, to fully analyze the data. So how we, uh, we are going to do the, the science? So we are building um, a great spacecraft, I think. So this is how the spacecraft uh, looks like. Uh, I would say it's a standard spacecraft. Um, uh, with the high gain antenna, so main body of the spacecraft. It's a it's a big spacecraft and five five tons in total. Uh, the peculiarity are obviously the the shape of the solar panels. So uh, we are far from uh, from the sun, so we need a lot of we need huge solar panel to generate uh, as much power as possible for the for the spacecraft and the instrument. So we have something like eighty five square meter of solar panels. Then in terms of, uh, of payload and appendices, it's quite interesting. So we have a long uh, magnetometer boom here, which is 10 meter long, where we put uh, all the magnetic and electric field uh, sensors uh, here because we want to measure uh, uh, fine uh, data of the Jupiter system and not the magnetic field from the spacecraft. So we have to be as far as possible. So 10 meters is OK. We have a long boom here for the, for the radar. The radar will uh, will penetrate the, the ice uh, to see what is going on underneath the surface. So we have a 16 meter radar antenna. We have four uh, three meter boom for um, what we call Langmuir probe. So that's uh, electric field and plasma measurement. So here, here, another one on, on the other side. We don't see it very well, but there are four of them. On this part of the of the platform, we have the all the remote sensing instrument, which we look into the same direction, fortunately. So we have a submillimeter wave instrument. Here we have a laser altimeter, we have the camera, we have the imaging spectrometer in the visible and in the infrared, and we have a UV spectrometer. 
The high gain antenna is used, and this there is a small antenna here that you can see. Uh, it's used for radio science. And we have some uh, plasma sensors on this side and on this side. So you see that it's a, a big spacecraft, a lot of instruments. Obviously, uh, we don't go to Jupiter uh, every year. So when we uh, we go there, we make sure we have the best uh, spacecraft and the best instrumentation. I was mentioning the, uh, the intercipillarity and the broad science of the mission. So here I give you an example for Ganymede how all the instrument will uh, will contribute. So if we have the, the illustration of the interior of Ganymede, so from, from the, the center, so the core up to the crust, and here we have also the atmosphere and the magnetosphere of, of Ganymede. And this is how all the instrument will contribute. So for the, here I put uh, the interior, so that's the localization. So the ephemerides or the location of the, of Ganymede in the, in the system, also interesting for science that will be done by radio science and the camera. Then for the core, it will be with radio science and the magnetometer. Uh, then for the liquid ocean, we'll use the radio science, the magnetometer, the laser altimeter, the radio and plasma wave instrument. For the crust here, we'll we will study it with the radar and the laser altimeter. For the surface, all the remote sensing instruments, so the camera, imaging spectrometer, and all, all the other spectrometers, the radar and the laser altimeter. And for the atmosphere and magnetosphere, all the in-situ instruments, the remote sensing, radio science, and the radar. So you can have an idea here that we, we will need all the instruments to fully understand the uh, Ganymede, how it looks like. And that also had some complexity in the planning because we want some instruments to work together, but we have some limitation in terms of uh, data volume and power. Um, but that's that's give you an idea of the complexity of the mission in terms of science, so broad and interdisciplinary. And in the planning, because we have to make sure that all the instruments work together when they need to work together. So some uh, some images of uh, of uh, hardware. So before we build the spacecraft, I will show you later some uh, images of the the real spacecraft. We have to build other models so to make sure that uh, the design is going on. So here, two or three years ago, we. Uh, uh, the industry built for us what we call a thermon model. So it's a one-to-one -one model of juice, but mainly to check that the, the thermal design is okay. And then we put the spacecraft into a, a vacuum chamber, which is where I work in uh, in Estec in the Netherlands. So I like also the, the, the aesthetic of this image. That's why I show it. But uh, that show you some of the tests that we are performing before we, uh, we built the, the real spacecraft. And here the tests have shown that the spacecraft design uh, was adequate, so we could move on to the, the next uh, model. Then the next model was this one. Uh, it is called the engineering model, and it's a one-to-one -one model, so it's kind of a real spacecraft, uh, but engineering just to test that the design is okay, that all the cables and instruments fit well, and to test all the procedure to integrate the instrument, to check that uh, from the electrical point of view, mechanical point of view, it's uh, it's all fine. So that's a very important model. And uh, at the moment, it's in Toulouse, in France, in the industry. But later, it will go to ESA. And once uh, we would like to test a specific uh, sequence of command on the real spacecraft, we'll test it, test it on this model just to make sure that everything is fine. So that's a very important model. So that's kind of... Uh, a uh, sister of a brother of, of Juice. And you see uh, how complex it is, I mean, with all the cables. And that's, for example, here, it's a, it's a part which is protected inside the spacecraft uh, to protect uh, all the sensitive electronics from the radiation of Jupiter. So we put that in a special chamber, which is here. Uh, that's the, 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 the star tracker. So you can, uh, you can have an idea of uh, complexity of, of a spacecraft. So that's an engineering model. And that's the real model, uh, which is at the moment in uh, in the industry in Germany. So that's a recent image which was taken, I think, a month ago. So you see that it's taking very uh, good shape. I mean, uh, the spacecraft, I would say it's almost uh, assembled. And you see here the size of the spacecraft compared to uh, to someone. So you can have an idea of the of the size. Here we have some uh, tanks for helium, I think. Uh, 
So that's the, the spacecraft is, is almost ready and we are at the moment assembling the, some instrument uh, for the, to test uh, next year the spacecraft in all the conditions to be able to, uh, to launch in space. So it's going quite uh, well from the, from the integration point of view, I have to say. Another view of the spacecraft, so that's the body of the spacecraft. And here you see a little bit the, the tank in which we will put the fuel uh, to make sure we, uh, we can uh, use the engine on board. So that's here. And here, that was a special operation. They, were, they, put, they put this deck on the spacecraft and that's the deck where we'll put all the remote sensing instrument uh, to make sure they are attached to the same structure and to make sure they will be properly aligned to look uh, in the same direction, because obviously we want the camera and all the other instrument uh, to look in the same direction, just to be able to compare the data. And that's why we put this, uh, this special uh, payload deck and that was assembled uh, last month. Another image of hardware, it's that's the solar panels. So you have seen at the beginning the, the peculiar shape of the solar panel. So that's one solar panel and we have uh, 10 of them. And again, you see, uh, you can compare uh, with the size of someone just to get an idea about the huge, the huge size of the solar panel. And given the cross uh, shape, also you can see that the deployment in space will be quite interesting. So once we launch, after when the, the solar panel will be deployed, uh, the sequence will be quite interesting and you can have an idea. We have done some uh, some footage, which you can find on, on Twitter if you want to see uh, some animation of the deployment. Uh, another image of hardware. We have many instruments, but I have selected only, only one. Uh, that's the radar. Uh, so all the electronics, all the cables. And so the, the radar was delivered uh, last month by the Inter Italian and the US uh, uh, colleagues. And uh, yeah, so that's what an image just before the delivery. And of course, they, uh, the social distance were taken into account in all of this. And the last but not least, uh, we have many models, but this one is also quite interesting. We have also a gold model. Uh, which is uh, which has been uh, built by uh, by one of the instrument team to check some peculiar um, properties of uh, antennas which are on this boom. So that's a pure gold model, and uh, but the model is very small, so don't worry. Uh, we don't have a one-to-one -one size model like that. I think here it's only a few uh, centimeters long. So now, uh, so that was an overview of uh, science spacecraft instrument. And now I will show you the, the journey to Jupiter. Um, so the journey to Jupiter will, uh, will start hopefully in June, 2022 and uh, will finish sometimes in 2033, 34. So we have, uh, we have made uh, an animation based on the real trajectory so what you will see is really what is uh, what is expected. Um, and uh, the journey of 12 years will be done in something like uh, nine minutes. So the first uh, the first aspect, of course, is the launch. So in uh, June 2022, we launched from Earth. We would like to go to Jupiter. Jupiter will come from from this side. We cannot go directly to Jupiter because the spacecraft is very heavy and the launcher is uh, is good, but it's not powerful enough to uh, to send us directly to Jupiter. So we have to make uh, three orbits around the sun and to take energy or velocity from uh, gravity assist or flybys of uh, objects like Earth, Venus, and Mars, just to get energy, more and more energy to be able to uh, to put the spacecraft to, uh, toward, towards Jupiter. So that I'm going to show that. So that's the launch. Then the spacecraft is here. So we do the first orbit around the sun. And there will be the first flyby a few months later of the Earth. So you see how uh, an Earth flyby will look like. And that's the uh, the green part represent the, the field of view of a camera because we are going to take some images, of course. Then a few months later, there will be a Venus flyby. Again, we take a little bit more of energy to uh, to be able to reach Jupiter. I got a lot of questions for Venus because of the latest uh, debate about the phosphine. So we are going to see if we make observations of Venus during the flyby. We have to check. 
Then there will be a second uh, Earth flyby. Again, uh, we can do that because we know the trajectory and we know the position of the Earth, so we know almost everything. Then we continue to take images and to calibrate some instruments doing the flybys. Then an interesting one will be the Mars flyby. Mars flyby at a very low altitude, so 1,000 kilometers. So here we are going also to uh, to take images and do a bit of science. Uh, I think that should be that should be interesting. Maybe we will. Uh, confirm the detection of methane, who knows? Then we, we have gained some energy, but not, not enough yet to go to Jupiter. So we have to make another orbit around the, the sun and also to, uh, to perform uh, the last uh, flyby, which is uh, at, uh, at Earth. So the flyby typically will be at a few thousand of kilometers. Okay, that's the last flyby. So we have now enough uh, energy to go to Jupiter and the remaining time will take something like uh, three years again to reach Jupiter. So all in all, it takes seven years. So just I stop here to show that here we will, we will be in the asteroid belt. And I got uh, questions about that. Are we going to have an asteroid flyby? The, the answer is uh, why not? That depends if there is an asteroid not too far. And if we can spend some fuel to uh, to go closer to an asteroid, so that will be discussed during the cruise phase. So Jupiter is here. We now we are going to switch on the instrument. We start the mission six months before, and we arrive at Jupiter, and we are happy because the great science and the great mission can can start. An interesting aspect of uh, getting around Jupiter is that we are going to uh, to switch on the engine, just to make sure that we break. Uh, and we decelerate to be to be caught by the, the the gravity field of Jupiter. But to help us, we use a gravity assist of Ganymede just a few hours before arriving at Jupiter. So while the other gravity assist doing cruise, for example, at Earth, Mars, or Venus, we are used to gain velocity, we are going to use Ganymede in that case to uh, to lose a bit of velocity to uh, to help to get caught by the. Uh, the, the gravity field of Jupiter. So that's a, a Ganymede flyby at 400 kilometers just before going around Jupiter. So it's quite uh, impressive, I mean, to do this sequence of, uh, of navigation. And now we are in the Jupiter system and we can start the mission. So there will be something like uh, 50 orbits around Jupiter for two and a half years. And every time we uh, we go close to Jupiter, we switch on all the instrument and we'll observe Jupiter. So here you see a kind of sequence. Uh, so you see here the field of view is in color of some instruments, so camera or imaging spectrometer in, in red. So we do all kind of uh, different attitude. Then when we are close to Jupiter, we also will be close to some moon. So here, Ganymede. So when there will be Ganymede, we switch off, we switch on the payload to Ganymede. And when we are done the Ganymede flyby, we continue with Jupiter. So you see again uh, how complex the planning will be because we have to do Jupiter, then the flyby. We have to do Jupiter again, but then we have also to download the data on Earth. We have to make sure that uh, the power is uh, is okay, the data volume is okay. So it's a lot of things to uh, to already think with uh, with the, the scientist. So the first, uh, at the beginning, there will be a few flybys of Ganymede. And then what one very important will be two flybys of Europa. There will be only two because of uh, radiation effect. We don't want to, uh, to burn the, the spacecraft. And that shows uh, an example of one Europa flyby. And because we are going to make only two Europa flybys, we'll switch on all the instrument as much as possible and to take as much data as possible. So. When we do a 24 hours of, of uh, flyby with all the data, so you, you see an ID here, that we have a 400 kilometers Europa flyby. So one day of, uh, of acquisition of data, it will take uh, a few months to download the data on Earth because we are far from Earth. So uh, that's also something to take into account into the planning. If we take a lot of data, it will take a lot of time to download on Earth. And when we download the data, we need to see if we do observation of other things at the same time. So it's uh, it's also not an easy uh, an easy process, but we uh, we are already thinking of it. Once we have done the Europa flyby, there will be an interesting uh, phase of the mission. 
because all the moons are in the equatorial plane of Jupiter. So if we are interested in the moon, and when we look at Jupiter, we can see mainly the equator. But uh, if you are a, a magnetospheric physicist, you would like to see the poles of Jupiter, also because of the aurora, in, for example. So there will be a phase of the mission that we will use the Callisto flyby to change the plane of, of inclination of juice. So we are not going to stay in the equatorial plane, but we are going to incline the orbit plane such that juice can see better the north and the south poles of Jupiter. And that you can see here. So we'll use gravity assist of Callisto to do that. And once we do a flyby of Callisto, as it is shown here, uh, we change the, the trajectory of juice. And at the same time, we do some interesting science at Callisto. So we'll check if there is a liquid water. We'll uh, take images of the surface to understand the geology and the history of the moon. We are going to check uh, or to, to study the, the small atmosphere around the moon. So a lot of interesting science also during uh, Callisto uh, flybys. So that's for, the, for this uh, phase. So once we have done the Europa, the high latitude phase, all the Callisto flyby, the orbit is such that uh, we decelerate as much as possible to be able to, uh, to enter in orbit around Ganymede. And that will be the last part of the mission, maybe the most exciting one. So we, uh, we enter in orbit around Ganymede. So we do some special maneuvers. And then the spacecraft will be around Ganymede for forever because once we are there, we don't have any fuel to, to do something else. So there will be a different series of orbits. So first we start with elliptical orbits, so far from the, from the moon and, and, and close to the moon where we'll do a, uh, mainly a bit of mapping, a bit of geophysics and also um, in situ instrumentation. So magnetic field, particles, and so on. Then there will be a high, light, high altitude orbit at 5,000 kilometers to, to do the mapping. Uh, so to take all the images, to, uh, to have the full map of Ganymede that, um, for all the remote sensing instrument. And then uh, we'll do some maneuvers to go closer. So the last orbit in principle, it's a five, uh, 500 kilometers orbit where we will do uh, mainly uh, geophysics um, in situ, so to study the, the, the little atmosphere, the ionosphere, and with the remote sensing, we are going to map, to map a few areas of interest, but we cannot do the full mapping at, at low altitude because we don't have enough time and not enough data volume to do everything. And if we still have some fuel, uh, we'll go closer. So for example, we have in mind to go to a 200 kilometers altitude. If the spacecraft is still okay, and if we still have some fuel. And at the end, uh, once there will be no fuel anymore, uh, that this is what will happen. So there will be, a, the, the spacecraft will not be controlled anymore. We cannot do anything with it. And the spacecraft will impact uh, Ganymede. So that will be the end of the mission for sure. Here we put February uh, 34, but that's just, uh, just an idea. Okay. And to, um, so that was for the journey. So I, go, I guess you have an idea of what will happen in the next uh, 15 years. Just a slide on the on the technique on the challenges because this mission is very challenging. So from the te technical point of view, we have the radiation environment of Jupiter, which is a challenge because uh, it's very difficult for a spacecraft to uh, to sustain into su such uh, environment. So we have to to protect it a lot with a lot of shielding around the spacecraft and around the instrument. The thermal aspects are not easy because it, at, around Jupiter it's cold, but during the cruise phase we go via Venus where it's uh, hot. So we have to, uh, to, to build a spacecraft which is uh, okay for the cold and okay for the hot conditions. The power is an issue because we are far from the sun. Uh, we want to study uh, in detail the um, uh, magnetic and electric field around Jupiter and the moon. It's very important for the science. So we need to have a spacecraft which is very clean from the magnetic point of view. And that's also a very technical challenge. From the operational point of view, uh, the navigation, I hope you, you get a little bit of idea about that. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, flybys uh, uh, around the planet. Uh, in the solar system, but also then uh, around Jupiter with the, all the flybys of the moon. So that's 
Uh, that's quite complicated from the navigation point of view. We have to make sure we are at the right place at the right time. Planetary protection is something which we have to deal when we uh, we work in, in, in planetary missions. So, for example, we have to show that we will never impact Europa. So Europa is a protected world from the planetary protection. And with our trajectory, we have to show that we will never impact Europa because it's just st strictly forbidden. Um, power and data volume, that's a, that's, a, that's a challenge because we are far from the sun and far from Earth. So we have little power, little data volume, and we have all the instruments that would like to work together and to acquire as much data as possible. So we have to uh, to make sure that everything is uh, is done within the constraint, and that's uh, not an easy task. So before, when I was showing such a plot, I had this programmatic aspect. Are we going to launch on Ion 5 on Ion 6? Uh, that was an issue a few years ago because the transition between Ion 5 and Ion 6 was exactly during our launch campaign. And that created some uh, some programmatic headaches. But now, with the delay of Ion 6, uh, this uh, challenge is uh, is gone. So that's good. And in terms of human challenges, of course, such a long project, I mean, uh, spanning over 20, 30 years, it's, of course, a challenge uh, from a human point of view. But that's uh, for every project. But that's it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind. And just that's my final slide. Um, um, so yes, yeah, so I hope uh, you uh, you find this mission uh, interesting, and I think it's a very fascinating mission. Where the, the 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 data that we'll get in ten years, I'm sure they will be uh, quite interesting to see, and all the images and so on. You can follow us uh, different websites. So I put it uh, a different uh, URL. So we have different websites with different information. Some are quite technical, so are more general. We have the Twitter account on Juice where you can see uh, regular releases of uh, images, videos, and we are making uh, also a movie about the Juice development. And you can see three episodes on this uh, URL. It's relatively easy to find. So we, we explain the, the background of the mission. And if you have any questions, you can, of course, always uh, ask me. So I will stop here. Wing, I hope I am a good time. Yeah, you're yeah, great. You're yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Thank you for your attention. Then. Um, um, there are right. some questions. Um, I am, if you cannot see them in the Q and A box, uh, I am actually copying and pasting them in the chat box. Ah, yes, I saw. I saw a question from uh, from Luis Alara. Let me check. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, I think in fact, yes, for the for the great red spot, it was more. Uh, um, I would, I would say uh, it was the message to launch on time was more uh, a joke because, of course, we will try to launch on time is respect to the size of the great red spot. But I thought it was quite interesting to see that the the, the, the evolution of Jupiter is such that some uh, features on the on the planet, in particular in the atmosphere, can change with time. So uh, that was just... Uh, a bit of a joke, and uh, so no more than that. And of course, we'll see uh, with Juice, we are going to study the atmosphere in detail. So we are going to see uh, what is the evolution of the great red spot and why it uh, decreases and what is the rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Michel, Ganymede magnetic field. Yes, for the generation of the magnetic field, uh, yes, I don't know. Uh, from my understanding, is that uh, there is an iron core. This is why um, how we can explain the generation of this dynamo. So something probably very similar to uh, to Earth and Mercury, uh, but that's uh, we have to study that in details. When that's why we have always a magnetometer on on board uh, to understand. Um, how does that work? What is complex at Ganymede in terms of magnetic field? It's because we'll be when we are on Ganymede, we'll be measuring the internal magnetic field of Ganymede. We'll be measuring the external magnetic field of Jupiter, which is variable as well. And we will be measuring also the induced magnetic field due to the to the liquid ocean. So that makes the situation quite complicated. So first we have to, to, to measure the magnetic field. We see which one is which one. 
uh, maybe to get the, the to 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 interpret the data to to get some models to see what's going on, and then after the people involved in the genera generation of the magnetic field, they will try to interpret the data and to propose a, a, a solution. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, with Alara, yes, I've been leaving the pressure of delivering hardware. Yes, yes, yes. I know all the teams are working quite hard, so uh, that's uh, great. I mean, uh, I have to say we have a great project. Uh, so the project team in ESA, of course, that pushes a lot the industry. We have a great industry, which pushes a lot. And we have a great instrument teams with, who, who are working hard. So all in all, uh, I think it's uh, it's great. Just can I remind participants very quickly um, that if they want, I can turn on their microphone. So if, if there is any further question and the participant feels like interacting with you uh, by voice, so with the microphone, that is possible. They, they can just send a message. Yeah. Okay, I see the next question. Would you consider making close flyby of IO? No, IO is really not possible because IO is, is, uh, is too close to Jupiter. So for us, it's too much into the radiation belt. So if we go to IO, the spacecraft will survive only a few hours and then the spacecraft will be dead. All the electronics will burn due to the radiation. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's just impossible with the, the design of the spacecraft. So if, if, for example, if you would like to study IO, you make sure you, you make a spacecraft very well protected with a lot of shielding around. So for us, it's just impossible. The, the closest that we can go is Europa. And we'll do only two Europa flybys to uh, to keep the spacecraft safe. But only with two Europa flybys, that will be the half of the total radiation dose for all the missions. So it's already quite a lot. So IO is just out of the question. I see. Uh, why it is not considered to put an RTG? Okay, why do we have uh, solar panels instead of uh, RTG? So radio uh, thermo. Uh, thermoisotope for that the power um, nuclear power like on uh, on Cassini uh, that's a good question in fact from the from the design point of view it's really possible to uh, to have solar panels in a mission up to the up to Jupiter and we have seen also Juno is uh, is using solar panels and the Europa clipper they are also using solar panels so from the from the technical point of view that's the limit so that's why we uh, we do that. But another reason is that compared to uh, to RTG, I mean there are also different technical reasons. It's a, it's a big question. Uh, it's a big question. Um, uh, but the solar panel, in terms of mass, with respect to uh, to uh, to power output, it's a good uh, it's a good compromise. So that's that's a good solution. And the solar the the RTG they decay with time. So because of the long cruise phase. When we arrive at Jupiter, there will be less output power also at, uh, from the RTG. So, and the last reason is that in Europe we don't develop also big RTG for 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 planetary missions. So there are many many reasons uh, that makes the the design of Juice using solar panels rather than RTG. Uh, Veronique de, uh, let me check. <laughs> I need time to read the questions. <laughs> In the slide uh, graph of Michel Blanc, we see Ganymede is not habitable. Yeah, in fact, in the in the uh, in the slide of Michel, uh, Ganymede is habitable. I think, if I remember, uh, yeah, so that's, a bit, uh, that's a bit uh, on the edge. I think, uh, yeah, the habitability of Ganymede is not very clear because of this uh, interface between water and rocks, which is clear in the case of Europa. But I think in the case of, of Ganymede, the, the interface is between water and ice, which makes the condition of habitability less, uh, less certain. So I think in the, in the in, uh, yeah, maybe we need to double check with Michel for his slide. Uh, what is the exact situation for habitability in case of Ganymede? It's clear that the conditions are not uh, as our Europa where the, the situation is uh, clearer. Andrew Jones, what are the possibilities for detailed observation of Callisto, and what do we know about this different di differentiation? Yes, yeah, so the uh, as far as we know, that was one of my the the plot on the graph on Callisto. So there is no differentiation 
of the moon. So that means there is no uh, different internal structure like on Ganymede, for example. On Ganymede, we have a clear iron core, then mantle, then ice, etc. On Callisto, it's not the case. I think it's due to the to the evolution of this moon, which is very different from the other moons. Most likely due to this uh, to its distance from Jupiter. So Callisto is very far from Jupiter compared to the to the, to the other moon. So the, the evolution has not followed the same path. Uh, so that's the the basics. That what we know, of course, is very difficult to know even for Earth. What is the interior? Because we cannot drill. I mean. Uh, you know that, so we have just to 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 interpret the data and to 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 get indirect information on what is the interior. With Juice, uh, how to probe the interior? We'll use the radio science just to uh, to to uh, to get precise information on the position of Juice during flyby, and from that, uh, the radio science teams they can they can measure the or. Uh, um, Get information on the gravity field of the of the body, and then from the gravity field of the body, you can derive what you think is the interior. So this is what we are going to uh, to do at Callisto, Europa, and uh, and Ganymede. Ah, uh, Yanis uh, d'Honduras. Instrument operation will start six months before Jupiter. What about cruise science? Uh, what about the risk of know-how instrument team evaporating? <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, yes. Yeah, so cruise science at the moment. So the the so the the, the the nominal mission starts six months before arriving at Jupiter, and usually during the cruise we are going only to switch on the instrument just from time to time to see if the instrument works well. So something like twice per year. And also during the the planetary flybys of Earth, Venus, and and Mars. So that's the the baseline. The the reason it's it's really a cost because we 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 will not have the full operations team during the seven years of cruise because we want to be ready at Jupiter and we cannot maintain uh, 10, 15, 20 people for seven years. It's because it's a cost issue. And when we design the mission, we have also to uh, to be within the cost. So if we'll have a, an infinite budget, we could have uh, the teams already now and preparing all the, the measurements during a cruise. This is not the case. So, But having said that, we uh, I'm pretty sure that once we know how the spacecraft behave, we, we will be able to, uh, to make some good uh, cruise observation. But th that we will discuss after launch. So at the moment, I would say it's not the case for continuous measurement during the cruise. But we have a good case uh, that will do something interesting about the the risk of evaporating from the uh, from the team uh that's a general concern but uh, that's why we have also the commitment of the the funding agencies i mean uh, I'm, I'm speaking about europe um, uh, cnes asi the german space agency i mean they committed to the mission so i hope that they will keep the i mean that's their their commitment they will support uh, the teams uh until the end of the mission to make sure that people are not evaporating <laughs> so that will be a bit uh a bit uh, peculiar that if we if we decide of our mission then there are no people anymore so but that's always a risk i mean even if there is the funding is there is there there is also you need to have the right people and for the instrument team it's not always e easy to keep their team uh, motivated with the 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 right people at the right time so yeah that's a general concern but People they do their best, and in general it works. But uh, sometimes it's not that easy. Okay, Graziella, uh, we see more mission conditioning, additional deep space cubesat to support close range measurement. That was it discussed for Juice? So, yes, uh, that's funny. After the the mission was accepted, uh, we got a few requests to add some cubesat. Uh, on juice uh, such that they could be sent to Jupiter and deliver there and do their their science, but unfortunately it came a bit late with respect to the to the juice program because if if you had a cubesat that means you need to have the cubesat still uh, powered by the juice spacecraft itself during the cruise phase, and all this add very uh, a lot of complexity and that was just not possible also in terms of mass. Uh, I mean we when we when you you work in the planetary mission you always have a mass problem. 
and that's also the case for Zeus. I mean, we don't, we cannot send an unlimited uh, mass uh, spacecraft there. So there is a power issue, there is a interface issue, there is a mass issue. I don't even don't even speak about the cost issue. So for Zeus, it came a bit late. That was just just not possible to uh, to agree on all these requests. Uh, so for future mission, if we do that, we need to 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 have this concept of CubeSat fr from the beginning. So in the proposal itself, otherwise I, I don't see you cannot add uh, that uh, late in in a project. Every project is very uh, difficult. So if you add stuff at the end or in the middle, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. I see that Michel replied to to Veronique, so that's okay. <laughs> so what is what did he say? Ah, okay. Ah, you don't see the answer? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Michel Blanc, yes. Ganymede is formally habitable and corresponds to the type 4 habitat. Uh, that's the classification from, uh, for planetary protection. But indeed, if the, wat if the water ocean is squeezed in between two ice layers, the question of availability of nutrients is very different from Europa, yes. So yes, so Ganymede is habitable, but a certain type, and it's not the same uh, type as uh, Europa. So Olivia, I have a I have follow up question. There's uh, just just uh, supposedly you know you you find you find some signature of of, of life or say biomarkers on on Ganymede. And what you, what would you do? Uh, I mean, you 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 said that you for planetary protection you want to want to crash the spacecraft on Ganymede uh, to avoid it yeah. landing on Europa, right? Now if you look, if Ganymede also has has a possibility of life, and what what are you going to do? Yeah, so uh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, let's see. That, uh, at the moment, it's very theoretical, of course, uh, but we have different scenarios. So if if uh, if we don't find anything new in terms of life at Ganymede, of course, we can enter into orbit and we can crash later on Ganymede. This is the status right now. If during the mission, uh, we find some interesting aspect related to habitability on, at Ganymede, if really the, the, the habitability question changed in the course of the mission, and if the planetary protection officer says that we cannot impact Ganymede anymore, that will be an interesting question because then we cannot enter into orbit at Ganymede. So that will be a very interesting situation if that happens. If we find, uh, if there is a new change once we are in orbit around Ganymede, we cannot do anything more because once we are around Ganymede, we cannot move anymore. We don't have any fuel to escape. So uh, that's uh, we we will impact uh, in any case. So you see different scenarios can be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 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 Laura, are there any other questions for us? Uh, see, I cannot see any other question. Um, no, this is the time. Um, if not, I think we can conclude the seminar. Thank you very much. Good. Olivia, thank you very much for the very thank nice talk. Very thank you very yeah. much to all and have a good uh, Christmas you holiday. Too. A very quick, quick reminder for the ones who are still online. We're going to have a new, uh, another webinar uh, on Monday, uh, December the 21st. 4 p.m. Uh, Beijing time, 9 a.m. European time with Professor Tomohiro Usui from JAXA. And it's going to be on the Martian Moon's exploration uh, mission. So if, you, if you're free, you're welcome to join. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.